and welcome to the very last That's Wild of the Year. We are very excited to have you live on a Sunday night from a swelteringly hot, low fault of South Africa, and it's going to be all about leopards. <laughs> Hello and a warm welcome. Uh, of course, most of you know, my name is Brent Yosmith and this is the last episode of That's Wild for 2023. The next time you're going to be seeing us in the That's Wild frame will be next year in 2024. And of course, we've got some very, very special guests lined up. Our dear friend and uh, Tristan Dix and our other dear friend, Margot Raggetts from Remembering Wildlife. And of course, this tonight's episode is all about remembering leopards. Normally... I would have started off talking about Remembering Leopards, but if we look closely on the Remembering Leopards book, we have a visitor tonight. Now we can zoom in on him. It's a large visitor. There we go. So I didn't want to disturb him until you managed to get a have, have a look at him. Okay, guys, sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, um, but I'm going to just see if I can do this. Here we go. Well, he doesn't want to fly away, so you might see him on the edge of the book. Beautifully camouflaged grasshopper or locust. Obviously, talking about camouflage, leopards have great, great uh, camouflage as well. Uh, actually, I'm looking at him again. He's not a locust. He's actually a, oh, a grasshopper. He's decided to abandon us. But obviously, um, we're celebrating Margot tonight and this incredible book um, all about the leopards and the subspecies that occur throughout the world. Of course, we are not uh, the only continent that has leopards, but we're going to get to that in a little while. So I think what we're going to do first is catch up with what's been happening on the live safaris this week. And uh, Gareth has been having a fantastic week. Now, I just want to warn everyone before we go into our first highlight um, that it is not for sensitive viewers. Um, it is of a cheetah and a very young animal um, that this young cheetah happened to catch. So just to be warned, it is a little bit difficult to watch sometimes. Um, but let's have a look at what Mabaibai's latest cub has been up to. So there we go. It, and as I said, it is quite difficult to watch. This is a, a, a tiny baby dwarf mongoose um, that was caught by the cub. Now, what's interesting is the cub and there's mom. Oh, crying. I'm sorry, mommy. So, yeah, difficult to watch. Um, but somehow the cub has been separated from her mother. We haven't actually managed to find them again. Um, hopefully we will in the upcoming week. But for a little cub, that dwarf mongoose could be what keeps it surviving till it finds its mom again. So it was seen calling for mom, and we've gone and checked for, for tracks of them. Maybe you saw the little chirp there. Uh, and we'll definitely keep looking, keep checking the western areas of the reed spread. And hopefully we do see them together. Oh, I think we made a bit of a whoopsie there, but we'll just carry on. Uh, straight into another one of Gary's fantastic sightings of uh, No Hope and her calf. Look how cute that is! Isn't that just the most delicious thing you've ever seen? Uh, tiny little baby rhino. Um, and sometimes mom can get upset with the boys. Now this is the big bull that we see quite often around camp. And he got escorted away from the, her little baby quite extensively. 
uh, or extensively, quite ferociously. And as you can see, um, Gareth and uh, whoever was on camera, I'm not sure who it was, probably Basil, did a fantastic job staying calm while they charged at them. There we go. Uh, isn't that absolutely wonderful? Those are two exceptional sightings that we've had this week. And oh, I can't even wait for what's coming. The Reed Spread keeps delivering and delivering. Uh, for those of you watching the Softens Pack Drive, we're making progress with our wonderful little Kuda Crip female leopard. And uh, we're very excited. As I said, uh, those of you watching will have heard, I think she's going to be a superstar. And... And of course, one of the, our favorite characters that we see regularly out here on the Respect Game Reserve is our Pride of Lions. And let's have a look what they were up to this weekend. And there's a cuddle puddle, as Jana just said into my ear. Isn't that cute? Now, these girls always seem to be in the best condition. We very, 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 very seldom ever find them um, hungry. Now, this little cuddle puddle turned into a little bit of a playful cuddle puddle. And I think someone got a little bit rough. And there were some teeth bared, but nothing too serious. And these interactions between lions are incredibly important. Uh, interaction because we know how lions feed. They can be quite brutal with each other. Um, and it, someone wasn't quite happy with the attentions, or I think she just got bitten in a soft spot. And uh, the, the sleeping lioness was not as impressed, saying, why did you do that? Behave yourself. Here you go. Again, another fantastic sighting on the Reed Spread Game Reserve. We are incredibly spoilt with the amount of time we get to spend with our big cats. Well, particularly the lions and cheetahs. And of course, as I say, in the years to come, I think the leopards are going to become superstars here. Uh, so it's been absolutely wonderful. Now, of course, three of our favorites are the big boys. Uh, and of course, one of the big boys is still currently carrying an injury. Uh, we saw him this morning on drive and he was fat and happy. Of course, he is still a bit sore, uh, but we are not going to intervene. Um, you can see here. So we had actually fed the wild dogs this evening and the wild dogs feeding brought the lions right next to the boma. And um, as you can see, they are absolutely gorgeous big boys in their prime at the moment. Now, you will see some footage that a lot of people find a little bit disturbing. Um, of um, There we go. There we've got a male in sort of full prime with a fat belly. And then we've got poor old Limpy Lou. Um, well, his, name is, his nickname is actually Mullet. He had the smallest mane in the beginning. He's got one of the biggest manes now. And you can see it actually looks like he's got quite a big swelling around his ankle. He doesn't want to put any weight on it. And you can see the muscle has sort of degraded uh, on the top of his leg. Saying that... Uh, he has managed to actually catch an impala while away from the other males just by himself. So he is still doing well. And injuries like this are quite common in the wild. Uh, so we don't want to interfere. Yet it's not life-threatening. It might be a bit painful for him. But as I said at the moment, he and his other two brothers ate a giraffe, a baby giraffe or sub-adult giraffe on Friday night. So they are very fat and very happy. Now speaking of giraffe, generally when we're talking about giraffe, the lions have been eating quite a few of them. and um, But here we have giraffe having the best time ever. This is uh, giraffes playing. And it's not something you get to see too often. I think the cool weather after some hot days uh, inspired the giraffes to have a gallop. And this is literally just giraffes playing. And this is one of my favorite little scenes coming up here. The one coming up, I think, in a few seconds. Oh, there we go. There's a the little kick step. That is, isn't that absolutely spectacular? Uh, it is very special to see animals sort of enjoying themselves and you can definitely see that they're having a good time. Uh, there's no sort of reason other than a bit of fun for the giraffes to play and run around like this. I'm actually a little bit jealous. That must have been an absolutely fantastic thing to witness, the giraffes cavorting. And um, I think Jan has set me up for failure tonight because the next lines. <laughs> is our wonderful pride of lions um, doing something else to a giraffe. So as I said, uh, this week has been a little bit difficult for the giraffes. Um, the males have caught one, and so have the girls. <laughs> I, we might have should have ended with the happy giraffe, Yana, I'm just saying, just saying. Um, but anyway, um, and it is very important. We, we did have a huge number of giraffes, uh, and one of the reasons we brought in three male lions was... Um, to actually bring their numbers down. We still sit on close to 200 giraffes in the reserve, so they're in by no means in danger 
even um, with the Lions munching lots of them. Now, we've had some fantastic submissions this week um, into the viewers' photo competition. And um, this is a, a well-known leopard is the first one. And the photo is by Liz uh, Wolf, and it is in the northern Sabi Sands, quite close to uh, Arethusa Camp. And it is of the gorgeous Tiani female leopard. Tristan, who's going to be joining us up now, knows Tiani very well. I think Tristy saw her when she was a few weeks old. So, love you to see how, what a beautiful big female she's grown into. I th if I remember correctly, Tiani's mom was Salaheche. And everyone thinks her dad was Anderson, but I can't remember whether the genetics came through on that. Um, and sticking in the northern Sabi Sands um, for the next one is by Michael. Um, and uh, it is also uh, while close to Arethusa, and it is Shadulu's cub on his way down a marula tree with a hyena nearby. Yeah, and you can definitely see that very distinct pattern of the marula bark behind. And if you look closely at the paws, you can see the little claws are out as it's climbing down the marula tree. Ah! I did not, I don't even know the next leopard, which is also a wonderful photo by Michael, who was on safari this year in South Africa, with Tristan, who will be joining us a little bit later. Um, and I was uh, sometimes given a bit of grief while I was working in that area, because Inkanyeni was my favorite leopard. Um, and this is her daughter, Watika, who I don't know if I actually saw. I think I have seen her. But when I was visiting friends at Buffalo's Hook. But she didn't have a name and she was very little when I saw. So that was from June of this year. Aha. Barbara, I wonder where you saw your next picture. Um, I was, I think I was there, possibly. So Barbara was uh, joined us and um, Connie and Cookie and Ali on a safari to Botswana this year. And we got the incredible privilege of spending time with the Jack's Camp uh, meerkat colony. Um, so very, very, very lovely there. Thank you, Barbara, for that. And you can see she is about to pop. Um, and the next generation of meerkats were, are going to be coming out. And then the last one is a video. Uh, also from this year and also from one of our favorite viewers. And uh, this was in Kruger. Uh, Julie spent quite a bit of time uh, here in the Hoodspread area, she did some volunteering with Rhino Revolution and Elephants Alive uh, and spent quite a bit of time going into the Kruger. And there's just a tiny, cute baby baboon playing on the road in Kruger. So that is absolutely spectacular. I love watching baboons. I think people often people uh, give baboons a bit of a hard time and don't spend enough time. But the social interactions and, and the babies playing is absolutely spectacular and I do enjoy spending a lot of time with baboons. But now that we're done with the wonderful photos and highlights of the week, we're going to go across uh, blah, blah, blah. we're going to go across to a quick break. Welcome to the South African Bush. My name is Brent Smith. This is a live game drive. Great, isn't it? Lions next to you. spoiled. 
here on the Ritz Break Reserve. How awesome is that, guys? Right past the front of our truck. Look at that, everybody. They are just unreal. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, of course, we've got our very special guest who's traveled many thousands of miles to be here today um, for Remembering Leopards. Indeed. Yes. There we go. Uh, of course, remember your questions for Margot. Uh, we will get to a stage later in the show where we'll talk about uh, the questions uh, about Remembering Leopards and about your story. And we've got some incredible videos to show you as well. We have another very special guest, also sometimes known as the Leopard Whisperer. Yeah, Tr Tristan, you're the Leopard Whisperer. <laughs> Tristan, are you blushing a little bit? <laughs> oh, no. It's just hot. Um, so we have the one and only Tristan Dix with us. Uh, we're very, very lucky to have two such special guests for the last show of the year. Now, Margot, you don't have to hold Thank the whole night. We'll put it down. Um, She's just attached to it. <laughs> See, I don't blame her. It is an absolutely magnificent book. I know most of you have the book already, but if you don't, tsk, tsk. And how's that, Tristy? Oh, did you open it now? I <laughs> opened it on Tristan's photo oh, of the one and only Hasana. Cute. Well done, baby. That actually wasn't even planned. I know. Yeah. You did very well. Though. Yeah, there we go. Very impressed. Um, so, yes. So, if you haven't got the book yet, please do. Um, it is a fantastic book. It's very easy. You can buy it from anywhere in the world. Just go onto the Remembering Wildlife website, which is rememberingwildlife.com. And um, you can be able to order order the book. <laughs> and if you you can also back order books. So, wild dogs, wild dogs, <laughs> wild, How do I know that wild dogs. <laughs> African wild dogs. African wild dogs. Well, the Indian ones are called something else. Yes, exactly. Um, um, but anyway, so... Um, very great to hear, and we're going to chat about leopards, and we're going to chat a little bit about the book before we get into anything else. Now, I'm surrounded <laughs> by two people whose favorite animal is the leopard. Um, You're in trouble tonight. I am in trouble. <laughs> they like watching things sleep for like eight hours at a time. But, um, no, I'm only teasing, of course. Uh, and, of course, we've been very lucky to see lots of leopards over our careers in the bush and mm. as photographers oh, and whatnot. This afternoon you got lucky. I know. Well I, and she's a very special leopard. I said, I hope she's going to become a bit of a superstar for us. Nice. Um, a little bit of a superstar for us in the next little while. Um, so that's going to be lots of fun. Um, but, anyway, let's chat. So, how many people... Guess that it was going to be leopards this year? Uh, I don't know. I think a lot of people kept 
expect me to do leopards for many years because they <laughs> all know it's my favourite. So whether I then actually um, fulfilled their wish or not, I don't know. But um, yeah, it's been a really special year for me to indulge myself in looking at thousands and thousands of images of leopards. Um, so yeah, it's been good. And uh, I suppose this is a good question. I think out of all the, the leopards in the book, I'm the only one who's seen one. You guys have at least seen two. Yes. Or three. Two. So no Indian leopard yet? No, I've got Indian. And Snow? Well, in the book. Yes. In the book. I said uh, in the book. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You did three. Yeah, yeah, three. So three. Yes. Okay. And uh, exciting. Hopefully four. So. Hopefully four. Sri Lankan soon. Exactly. Exactly. We're on a mission. That's wow. very, very exciting stuff. Yeah. I'm very jealous. <laughs> now, of course, even though in a lot of the leopards range and a lot of the, the leopard species and subspecies in the book might not be considered to be endangered at the moment, there's a lot of threats. And I mean, just this that's sitting right on our table and it sits on our table every night um, of That's Wild is of a male leopard in perfect health. He's not an old male. His teeth aren't broken. And this actually comes from this, well, from uh, where Ledward was. Um, and almost certainly this animal was shot. Um, illegally, without a permit, uh, and my dad actually found this skull while he was walking. Um, to see a leopard with, I mean, you look at these teeth, it is in such good condition. Um, so there are threats that, that's, um, oh God, sorry. It's out, the... Yes, it's, uh, <laughs> it's fruit chafers, it crawls as well. Okay, it's gone. And very, very, very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so, it, I mean, it is something, and, and, and that lends towards where the remembering concept comes from yeah so i mean actually every species that we featured but virtually every species on this planet is um at threat mainly from humans yeah. um in some way or other and so whether it is through poaching or the illegal wildlife trade whether it is through um hunting in some way um whether it's through snaring which i know is a big issue uh, in this area um, and just also habitat loss. So there are more and more humans everywhere taking over and less and less space for these animals. So they're coming more and more into conflict. So the, the concept of the series is that we have to remember them now, but also if we don't save these species in the future, this will be what they were like at this time by the best photographers in the world. Um, and we, as if we were looking back and remembering them because they're no longer here. Well, hopefully, due to the incredible work that you guys do, we're not going to get to that stage. Hope not. Yeah. Now, a bit more fun. <laughs> so, obviously, we've all seen a lot of leopards. We, we did briefly touch on who your favorite leopard is. Um, and Bahati. Bahati. Have I seen Bahati? You might have, around Rakira. I, mean, I have seen, I saw quite a lot of leopards in the Mara, but I was following cheetahs at that stage. They were my character. Yeah. Mm. You might have seen her. I mean, yeah. she's a very prominent female that is around there. So. I'm saying you saw her just a few weeks ago. Eh? I did. I did. Jealous. So, oh, yes. Your, and your favorite leopard of all time? Uh, yeah, tough, because there's a few, but it's probably the one that's on the cover. Tandy. Tandy? Mm. Mrs. Snarly Face. Yeah, she... Um, She's a good cat. Uh, if you think about it, not many leopards have raised as many litters as what she has. Her mom. Her mom is the only other one, really, that I know of that's... Ooh, Vomba. Vomba, maybe. But how many was Vomba? Five. Five. Yeah, so, I mean, she did and six. And Masha Ben, I think, did six. Yeah, so, I mean, those are, there's not many of them that have done it. Tavangumi. And then also like that she was small and feisty. Ah, okay. Which is always nice in a leopard. So, my, my favorite leopard didn't last to adulthood. No. Shongile. Yeah, she was she was cool. Yeah. I, enjoy Shongile. I think your favourite leopard killed her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. That's not funny, but it's, it's, it's probably true. Yeah, that sighting was. Or at least chased her out of, well, of, I mean, of the area. The thing is, is in that sighting we just don't know. And, yeah. I mean, we left it with Shongile in the tree, Tandi below, Tingana there, mm. Tamba there, Hosana there. Oof. So any yeah. variable, any amount of variables could have happened. But, yeah, we never found anything, so. And uh, your favorite leopard sighting, standalone leopard sighting, doesn't need to be a leopard you know well or whatnot, so Margot? I, I think it has to be, and we were discussing this earlier, the, um, the picture of the leopards drinking um, that I've got in the book because it was so unexpected. 
So it was in the central Kalahari in Botswana last year. It was so hot that we sat under a tree in a watering hole. Um, I was trying to do birding because I'm trying to learn. Um, and um, just suddenly having sat there for like half an hour dead quiet with a camera set up pointing at the water hole through the bushes, through the, the grass, um, a single female leopard came in and started shyly looking and drinking and her tongue was lapping and I was thinking oh my god this is amazing I know this is special is my camera set up is my camera on am I taking the right pictures um, and then suddenly absorbed in the camera I looked again and thought I'm seeing double here and, and her sub-adult came in um, so to have that just us in a place where I was not expecting it, the leopards are not habituated in the way that you guys are used to in the sands at like all. Like the one we saw this evening. Yes, exactly. So just really, really shy. And it was because we were dead quiet and just sat there for a long, long time. You could see, you can see in the picture that they're kind of aware that we're there, but um, felt safe enough that they could start drinking. So just because that was so unexpected and so special. Um, but it has to vie with sightings of Bahati, because yeah. I just love Bahati. So <laughs> I, I, I'm always looking for her when I was there in the Mara. Fair. Hmm. Oh, don't ask me this question. Like, <laughs> I, everyone always asks, and I honestly, I mean, I think I mean, we've had this discussion. I think sightings are different for different reasons. Yep. So having favorite sightings is like dependent on, was it like an action sighting? Was it just something because it's a reward to you personally that's... Fun? Action sighting. Oh, Brent, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, uh, personal sighting. So personal sighting, I would say probably finding Tandy with those tiny, tiny cubs that didn't survive. Um... You know, she gave birth during the course of the day, and we found her in the afternoon. So, much so like, you, you and I, I think, the only ones who found leopard yeah, cubs that small. And the same den, which is crazy. Yeah, exact same den. Yeah, so, um, I think that would probably be just from following a cat for so long. Yeah. And then, like, that build up, knowing she's pregnant, knowing that there's going to be the behavior of looking for a den, and then obviously finding that den. And the cubs being as small as that is, I mean, there's very few people that yeah, see I, cubs of I, that I, age. I, I, out of everyone we know, I think. It's you and I, the only two people who found them are less than eight hours old. And yeah, so tiny, tiny. So I think that would probably be the top sighting for me, mm -hmm. um, just given the whole context of it and then also the rarity of it. You know? Sure, I think for me, it must have been the, the beginning of the process of on foot with Hassan and Shangile. I mean, that's also, those days are so crazy. Yeah. Right? Those sightings so the, on the, foot. So the first one, the first time ever was myself, Rex, and, and Batman. Yeah. And she saw us and walked, and she did. Not real Batman. No. <laughs> Craig. Craig. Craig the cameraman. Okay. Nicknamed Batman. Don't yeah. <laughs> and um, she, I mean, she just walked past us and just climbed up this giant jackalberry and mm. sat above us, this yeah, six crazy, month yeah. old leopard cub. And then a Kunyuma, or Senegal bush male. Yeah, and he's looking good. I saw uh, him. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So, so, he's, he's tatty, but yeah, he's looking good. Cello pan. Yeah. Three big dugger boys yeah, sitting in the pan. So three big buffalo, and he just walks up and whacks it on the bum because he can, and then jumps up the Tamboti tree, and the buffalo are trying to get him, and he's sort of like, you can't catch me. No, exactly. So that was, that's a strange sighting. There's lots of those kind of things. I mean, yeah. like that, that sighting I had way before I ever was at Wild Earth of um, Karula with all of those other... So there was six in total that were around that termite mound, and they were all kind of, you know, competing for a kill. But no. to see that many cats together, that's also very special. Oh. Karula blowing bubbles. That was crazy. That was a good one. She was hissing at Tandy, yes. her daughter. Or was it Shadow? I can't remember. No, it was Shadow. It was Shadow. Her, uh, sister. Tandy's sister. And she got so upset while she was hissing, she just blew this big spit bubble. Uh, and yeah, that was that was a weird one. Yeah, there's been some... I mean, this is the thing. That's, that, yeah. With leopards, that, one thing with them, which is, I suppose in a way, a little bit like dogs too, is that they... Glad you work get, dogs in there. Well, they get themselves into <laughs> crazy situations where they yeah. interact a lot with other predators. Um, and other animals in general. So, I mean, like I had a sighting now in the Mara, I was telling Margo about it, where we had two leopards, a cheetah, male lion, and a hyena, all chasing each other around. So, Jeez. you know, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the thing with them, is that you just never know what you're going to get, and anything's really possible. And and is six together your maximum you've seen together? Yeah, I mean, in the same sighting, yes. Yeah. No? Eight. Londos. Londos, yeah. But that that's was the a thing is, if you get females with cubs, and yeah. it can get weird. So we had a uh, female... We had like four females in Eastress yeah. trying to mate with one male and a couple of sub-adults running around. Yeah. Um, 
But I mean, then there was Ravens that, Court with the older male and the two cubs. Yeah. That was, they lived, I mean, there was a leopard family of multi generational cubs staying together in the Swabi Sands. Yeah. Crazy stuff that happens. With these my, my first ever game drive in Africa. Swabi Sabi. Sabi Sabi. I saw five that afternoon, and the guide was saying, this is really special, honestly. Were they together? Ever. Yeah, so, okay, so, so it was a mother and two cubs, and then a female came in, and then a male came in after. Okay. So there's five together, and so he's like, this is no, special. that's very special. And I'm like, yeah, he's just saying that, and <laughs> no, I've never yeah, seen, just, yeah, exactly, I've never seen <laughs> five together since. So. Outside of Londo, I think five. Yeah, I mean, like, well, we saw it at, at, in Northern Sabi Sands, it was a Tingana... Hosanna, Shungile, Karula, and occasionally Tandi or Shadow. Yeah, you know, so, uh, and again, I mean, we're lucky we used to spend what, eight hours a day doing that every day for yeah. many years. Yeah, I mean, look, our, our amount of time we spent with leopards is, is yeah. not what most people will get. No, that's um, no. I mean, even, you know, Margot, when she was in Amara, got to spend a lot of time with leopards. Bahati, yeah. Um, yeah. Which is abnormal. You know, most people, when they come on safari, are, are wanting to see multiple different things, and so. You know, elephants and lions and all these things take the shine. But given the jobs that we all had and the abilities that we had to spend time, um, I think we've got a quite a distorted view. Not view, <laughs> but e experience yeah. with, with, with leopard. Yeah. We're very, very lucky. But we're going to keep chatting leopards after this short break. Painted Dog TV and our conservation partner as we work together to protect and conserve wildlife in Africa. You can join us live from anywhere in the world to do your part for the magnificent wildlife of Africa. Welcome to the Timber Mighty Game Reserve, the world's first ever live virtual elephant collaring. Very important to keep the elephant breathing, to always pop a stick in the trunk. Absolutely amazing. This is 100% live, coming to you from the middle of the Timber Mighty Game Reserve.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, very exciting. As I said, we, we've got such special guests here who have done incredible things in their lives. Uh, we're going to focus now a little bit more on Margot for the next little bit and about the Remembering series and how it started. We do have some footage, thankfully, from Margot, shot <coughs> by and edited by a good friend of ours, Adam Bannister, um, from the early days. And basically, I think let's just ask you to tell us the story. What, what inspired you to start the Remembering series? Uh, well, I had been working in Kenya as a resident photographer for about four years. Um, and at the end of one stint, I went up to northern Kenya to Lakipia. Um, I was staying at Lakipia Wilderness Camp, which we used to go to particularly for the African wild dogs at that point. And now um, Giza, the black leopards, being seen there a lot as well. So I'd love to get back there and see that. Um, but one morning, uh, we were woken up at like 4.30 in the morning by the sound of hyenas going absolutely crazy. Uh, went to investigate at first light. And what we found was something I had never seen before, which was an elephant that um, was a very young elephant. We thought about 14 years old, um, who had died and was being eaten by hyenas. And so I, we are going to just so you know, there is some pictures of this, though, just a warning that it can be a little bit disturbing, so you know. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, well, it was disturbing for me too, uh, because wow. I literally had no idea. Yes, that's the picture I took that morning. And I'm sorry it's shocking, but it's really important that people actually see this picture because I had no idea um, what was going on with the poaching crisis. And that was the height of the poaching crisis at that point. So they think about an elephant a day was being killed by poachers for its ivory. And I said to the guys, what's happened? And they said, well, it would have been shot by a poisoned arrow and it obviously got away from the poachers, but it would have taken four or five days to die a very slow and painful death. And we don't know whether it had died completely before the hyenas started eating it. And I was shocked and upset and angry and I also realized I had an epiphany at that point that lots of people um, uh, who come on safari have no idea that um, what's actually happening to wildlife um, and even people who are working in camps like me had no idea um, and once I knew I couldn't unsee it you know it's actually you know around the corner behind the hill down the valley elephants uh, or other animals are being killed by poachers by snares by human wildlife conflict and I thought to myself, what can I do with all my life experience? I used to have a business career and I've got a kind of marketing background. I knew a lot of photographers as well at that point. What can I do to make a difference here? So could I do a book? Could I do an exhibition? The idea was a one-off book on elephants to raise awareness of elephant poaching and to raise money um, to fund anti-poaching work. Um, so I started approaching different photographers who I knew. So Jonathan and Angela Scott, who I've said many times, have been amazing mentors to me. Um, Federico Veronese, um, who was often in the Mar at that point, and I got to know a, a few others who I knew. I started writing to them and saying, you know, I might do this book on elephants. Would you give me a picture each? Because I figured if I did a book, I wasn't well known. No one would buy my book. But if I had big names such as them and Franz Lanting and Art Wolf, then maybe together collectively we could sell a book. And though um, it's been done a lot since, no one had actually got all the photographers to work together at that point before, so it was kind of quite a unique idea. That's, that's quite a tricky thing, because there's quite a lot of big egos and, and <laughs> dominant personalities rather there, than egos, should I say. Th there are, but it also can play to the kind of competitive edge. So once you could say, well, you know, Jonathan Scott's in it, or Franz Lanting's in it. I have to be in it. No, exactly. They're like, well, of course I will too. So it, I, I managed to play to the well, right why'd side. Why you let Tristan into the book? <laughs> well, no idea. We're still trying to work that out. <laughs> Very... Um, but yeah, so we did uh, this first book. It took like a year and a half to make, Remembering Elephants. And I was genuinely thought it was a one-off book. And it sold out in two and a half months flat. Um, there you go, there's a Federico's. shot of the cover. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's Federico's image, actually. And it, I didn't, I wasn't biased to put him on the cover. I looked at a lot of images, but that just was a standout for me in terms mm. of images that we had submitted. Um, so... If, you, if you, you haven't got it here. No, I think um, it's inside. Yeah, but so it's, um, yeah, so, and, and, and we did two and a half thousand copies um, that first year that we crowdfunded. It sold out in two months and people started saying to me, as they do every day of my life now, what's next? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, the very amazing thing, and I think we at home as well just need to give Margot a massive round of applause, that um, even before Leopards, 
it's over a million pounds. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. We're we're now we're on the cusp of, with donations. I have committed to that. I know I can make. We're at one point one million pounds now. So. Well done. Thank you. Round of and, applause. Um, I've been lucky enough uh, to be with you over some parts of the, your trip to South Africa. We were down in Cape Town, uh, where there was a book launch, and we uh, you were with Helen from the Cape Leopard Trust. Yes. And. Um, <laughs> Already you've managed to donate to the Cape Leopard Trust from Remembering Leopards. Yes, indeed. So so for them, I mean, the Cape Leopards are fascinating. So I went into the Cedarberg Mountains, which is kind of the home of the, the Cape yeah. Leopards. Didn't, um, <laughs> didn't get any sight. No one does. I've seen one. Oh, well, well. My brother's seen one when I was there. Yeah, yeah. so it's all camera trap images mm. there. But... Um, that, although I did see a caracal, which was pretty really cool. cool yeah. um, but, uh, yeah, so they're doing amazing work because they are there. So, um, and, and you guys can describe better to me, they're kind of half the size of mm, what we even, would... Even less. Yeah. So a big see. male uh, cedarberg leopard, like 30, 35 mm. kilos, which is Can be even than, smaller, like 28, 27. Yeah, which is smaller than what we consider a small leopard tandy. Yeah. Tandy is bigger than that. Oh, by a long way. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and a big male leopard... There's a lot of debate. Big, low-fault male debate. Debates, I like this. Um, <laughs> who's the biggest or whatnot. But, I mean, anything from 90, possibly pushing 100 kilos at the top end. And I think I know only know of two animals that were maybe 100 kilos. Yeah, I mean, Anderson I'd, and Campan. Yeah, I mean, re realistically, not many of them. There was that other male around, um, uh, Skakuza and Bovala. Uh, yeah, and um, old Paleface, uh, Manuletti. But yes. That was a long time ago. Yeah. That was 2000. But even then, it's like how much have they eaten? You know, yeah. what's, we, the scale can be tipped a bit. Um, but I mean, those females are tiny. They're smaller than caracals. Yeah, they it's are. crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, and I, I love the idea, and I cover this in the book that there are leopards that are never seen, because I think people get really, um, you know, you you see leopards at Sabi Sands and and shows like Painted Dog TV show them, and um, and even in the Maasai Mara where I spent a lot of time. I mean, they're very habituated, yeah. and we were talking about habituating uh, or habituation earlier, but a lot of leopards, I wonder, actually you guys could estimate how many, what percentage of leopards in the world are not habituated and not seen? What do you 90. Think? Yeah. Maybe even more. Oh. Really? Well, just wow. think about the whole Congo Basin forests and oh, the massive Miombo forests just, just in Africa. Just think of Javan, Javan. Arabian, Persian, mm. um, Indo-Chinese, Amur. Like, I mean, those are... Uh, and are we, I mean, yeah, we, because camera trap photos don't mean they're habituated. No, no, they're they're not, yeah. they're so, seen, they're yeah. you know, even within Africa, I reckon it's probably 90% are unhabituated leopards. And if, yeah. you just, if you just think about those, those massive Mopani belts and even in Kruger but going up into the them. The fact that we have South unhabituated Africa. cats in Sabi Sands yeah. goes to show you how many unhabituated cats are out there. Yeah. 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 So, I yeah, I I, for me, I would say 90%, 90%. at least. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's really important that people know that yeah. because everyone's like leopards. You know, some people were saying, "Why have you done a book on leopards?" I'm like, seriously, guys, that the amount of space that they have to live in is continually reducing. Yeah. We actually don't know how many there are. And again, I'm working with Luke Hunter, one of the foremost experts in the world, trying yeah. to pin him down on, come on, how many leopards are in Africa? He's like, mm, we don't can't know. really tell you. <laughs> a few. Yeah, exactly. But this is the thing. is, And you know, the, the funny th part about leopard too is like a lot of people are like, oh, but leopards are not in date. But if you take this book and look at the subspecies, mm. I mean, Amor, Indo-Chinese, Javan, Persian, Arabian, Arabian, um, are all in like they all severely declining. I mean, Arabian is probably less than a hundred individuals. Mm. Well, Javan is less than three fifty. Yeah. Indo Chinese is less than. Well, they actually don't know. No. They've actually and just. Amma, they don't really know either. Well, yeah, Amma has now been joined with North China, and yeah. North China at one point was like less than a hundred or something. Right. So, you know, that, that, there's a number of spe subspecies of leopard that are drastically in decline and when we spoke to Luke Hunter he was saying that there's not a single population that isn't declining every single leopard population is decreasing yeah yeah and then you've got problems with Sabi Sands and populations that seemingly are doing well yeah because actually if they do well and there are too many there's in no that area space. there's no more space which is what they're seeing now but there's, there's lots of interesting stuff about that and 
cub survival rates are completely tanking at the moment. So they well, that could be them sorting themselves. The, out. Well, this is what's they what's kind of coming to the fore lately is they reckon that the cub survival rate over the last five years has changed quite drastically since pre-drought. A lot more young males running around. So a lot more young males, and therefore not many cubs surviving, which will then eventually bring the population down enough again that they'll start to then have space to grow again. So wow. super interesting. And then yeah. I mean, just on the with the remembering. Leopards launch. We had Kerry Camacho here. Yeah, I mean he was super and, interesting. And um, yeah. the strawberry leopards. What they're finding out it's a it's a lack of new male genetics into an area. So those dispersal males are not getting out of areas like we're in here. Mm. They're hitting farmland and 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 human habitation. And there are populations of females up in the mountains. So they are ending up mating with related leopards, which is causing that recessive yeah. recessive gene and and that leucism, and which is called the strawberry leopard. And, and they have problems to divert from leopards for a second. They're again with lions in the Mara for the same reason, don't they? So actually, there's well, the yeah. lions well, that are living too long. I'm not going to go into that <laughs> okay. one. Yeah, let's um, not. That's a little bit more complicated. <laughs> okay. And that Slippery or slope. could be some interesting management tactics by KWS sure, that's sure. causing that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Which, I know, well, I'm dead set. Can of worms I'm not quite ready to deal with right now. No, exactly. Let's <laughs> rather not go down that road. I'm still going to go to tomorrow at some point in my life. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, there is fascinating stuff, and there is there there are definitely um, populations that are under threat. I mean, if, you, if we're talking about cat leopards again, then um, you just look at the size of the home ranges. Yeah, we were chatting about it the other day. It's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. So your Sobi Sands is a bit of a funny one because it's an impala farm because there's a lot of man-made clearings and whatnot that have a lot of impalas. So your leopard density is actually higher than there would be in a if there weren't the sort of high numbers of impalas, high well, numbers of water holes. Water holes is the big water holes, and, which that is the driver for the high impala number. High, and yeah. with the with the nice mowed lawns around them and whatnot, um, um, so the leopard numbers wouldn't be as high as they were if there weren't water holes and man-made infrastructure, dams, etc. So in a way, there there's oh, 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 another can of worms, um, but. That, so, so you've got that. Oh, no, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, we're talking about the size. Mm. Yeah. So in prime leopard territory in the Sabi Sand, so along the Sand River or the Sabi River, I mean, you've got males that have territories less than 1,000 hectares, so 2,500 2, 2, acres, 2.2 thousand acres. And females, I know, um, on the Sand River, 400 hectares, mm. 800 acre territories. And um, what was that? The, the main male in the Cedarburg, what was this? It was like... like f it's crazy, it's like 350,000 or yeah, something stupid. Three, that's like three, not three million, sorry. Yeah, 350,000 hectares. Yeah, yeah three so and it's half thousand like 700,000 acres. 700,000 mm. acres for one male. Yeah. And the females crazy. are like 150,000, 200,000 hectares. Yeah. It's mad. So, so, so what are snow leopards then, guys? Oh, snow leopards, it depends, again, also mm. in the areas. Food availability. Food availability. And I, I don't think they even know. Yeah. From when we were there, you know, we spoke to people there that they were like, well, we're not really sure because the, I think the problem with snow leopards is the more remote you get, the less food there actually is. And so I'm sure there's a drop off of... Because yeah. well, they, they yeah. do, the snow leopards do rely on domestic livestock. Oh, hugely. They are hit, they hunting a lot of yak and goat yeah, and that's sheep. Saying and, that, so, and if they go, and I think the further up you get so that, I mean the, yeah the further into into the Himalayas and then I think also the further into these kind of countries that are less developed like India is a, is a huge population right and so what was surprising to me is going into into the Himalayas there's I thought oh nice oh. tortoise people yeah very yeah, pretty fool's gold tortoise mm. people yeah. um, I thought that we would um, we'd get into a very remote area and there wouldn't be a lot of people but every single valley has got people, people in it and not a lot of people but they've got them yeah so there's and with people is always going to be livestock yeah. especially in a, in a harsh environment like that they yeah. need you know they need milk and all these kind of things to survive there um and well speaking of that i mean one of the first donations made from the remembering leopards um was to a part of the world that is probably got quite a healthy snow leopard population in theory but it is completely worn torn i'll let you 
Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so it's actually a, a WCS project in Afghanistan um, where I had no idea they had snow leopards. Um, <laughs> although, interestingly, talking about kind of um, the higher up you go, kind of less people, one of the things they were talking about there is that with climate change, um, actually, people are able to go higher up. Um, ah. And so, therefore, there is more conflict happening. Um, and this pro uh, project was very well funded, but because of the political situation, there now um, a lot of US funding was withdrawn so we were able to make a, an emergency $30,000 grant it's the first one from this book um, to keep uh, people employed um, and working on um, mitigating human wildlife conflict with, with snow leopards in Afghanistan. Yeah, Tristy's got a, a map of them. A map of a snow leopard distribution there for you to have a look at. Just and a picture that you're jealous of. Yes, very, but 12 countries is where they occur. Yeah. Okay. So that's also what makes snow leopards very, very difficult um, to conserve, I think, is you know, you, when you're dealing with an animal that crosses 12 different countries, some of them war torn, and, and, some of them and, economically and, and, unstable. And a lot of those populations are cross border populations, yeah. they're not mm -hmm. in a single country. So yeah. uh, the, the population itself is dependent on two different countries uh, working together to conserve the species. Yeah. And also, I mean, the further away you go from sort of India, Pakistan, even Mongolia and stuff, you're dealing with very rural countries with very low income. Yeah. Uh, people who are living literally on, 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 on the bread line. Yeah, and so obviously when your livestock is attacked, um, you're going to be very upset. Yeah. And one of the things, we've just released a podcast series actually, to give that a plug um, for remembering, and, and we've got an interview with the guys in Afghanistan. One of the things they're dealing with is actually security. They can't use camera traps because they're accused of being spies. Well, same as in Iran and, Iran, and exactly. Iraq and all of those. Yeah, but, I mean, there's different species yeah. of animals. Yeah. But cheetahs and leopards. Yeah. 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 So can you imagine well? how you would do a game count or a, ca a like numbers count of snow leopards? Well, the only way you could probably do it is you'd have to do Chopper. no drone would be your best bet well, then you're definitely a spy and you're going to be shot well <laughs> you're not going to do it in chopper either yeah. i can tell you that much you might get shot yeah well legitimately someone will die yeah. a drone might just get shot but <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know so i it's don't no I, wonder that we have no idea mm. yeah but i mean that's yeah. and we're talking massive distances yeah. and but i mean even if you if you just think about talking about numbers of animals how even with camera traps you know how difficult it is to find out how many leopards just in the Congo Basin. Mm. Oh, but uh, you, ma there's too many paths. Like, there are too, too many, many paths, places. And the elephants like, but he pulling the camera traps apart and mm. smashing them. And then you've got gorillas and the chimpanzees, and the also, chimps. chimpanzees also steal your camera traps all the time. Gorillas too, I would imagine. Yeah. No, they did, they've actually did ignore them. Really? It's chimps and elephants. Mandrels? They must be bad no, in the bottom. It's really weird enough. It's, it's chimps and gorillas. I mean, chimps and elephants are like breaking camera Yes, traps. but elephants are naughty everywhere. Yeah. But honestly, coming from not a background in wildlife and conservation in Africa like you guys, you yeah. grew up here, from living in London, I would literally, I'm like, what do you mean you don't know how many there are? Yeah, and any <laughs> of the species I'm talking about. Yeah. And, th and then with cheetahs, there's precisely 7,200, which is really helpful. Well, I still think that's not quite right either. I think there's some oh. populations where they've over exaggerated and other populations are under exaggerated yeah you can say that there's a bout yes yes because a cheetah might have died today so yeah. how then a seven thousand one hundred and ninety nine and, 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 and yes, cheetah like born. dying a lot but lions yeah. keep killing them yeah. um but yeah i mean that type of stuff is absolutely fascinating now um guys we are going to uh, be getting towards um, the end of the show where you're going to get to chat to Margot and get to ask her questions but before we get to our last little segment let's go to break Welcome to the South African Bush. My name is Brent Smith. This is a live game drive. Great, isn't it? Lions next to you.
Welcome back. So our last little section before we get into you getting to ask Margot and Tristan all the questions. All the questions. I've got a few questions for them myself. <laughs> They're going to be good ones. Oh, wow. Well. Um, I've got one especially for you, Tristan. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, and that is, um, of course, we did a book launch in Hoodsprate a few nights ago. Tristy was yeah. there helping me talk nonsense. And, of course, Margot. Um, and um, we managed to sell out. Actually, both book launches we've sold out. We have, yes. Um, in South Africa, which is absolutely well, uh, amazing. So well done to all the South Africans who bought prints and books and whatnot. Um, but this book launch in Hoodsprate was an aid of quite a new project that's going to be starting next year um, based on leopards. They're already working with wild dogs, pangolins and cheetahs. So you might have heard us chat about them a little bit. So it's um, Contemplate Wild. Um, so it's a hundred thousand rand, which is... Oh, $8,000. $8,000. $7,000. $7,000. Somewhere there. Um, which is going through to Contemplate Wild. Now, they operate in the Kruger, on the borders of Kruger. The, one of their most important things is, is the early detection of snared animals, which is a massive problem, problem in South Africa at the moment. Um, they're working with some really interesting technology, which I can't go into too much detail about um, mm. at the moment. Um, but, but even just detection of animals crossing into areas that are potentially yeah. dangerous. So it's before okay. they even get to a point so where... With the, the, co the collars on the dogs, yeah. if a dog goes into an area where they've had high episodes of snaring before, yeah. there's an alert sent out. Yeah. Um, and the big difference that, between the information that's coming in, we did chat a little bit about this at the, the book launch other night, is generally even on the best systems you may be getting a ping every hour mm, yeah if yeah. you're lucky yeah this system you can actually set it to ping every 30 seconds if you want so if you know there's a snared animal or a, a, a individual you can change the ping and you can stick on it and that data is coming in real time yeah. and what that has enabled uh louis and, and the team from contemplate wild to do is just from data figure out whether an animal snared or not without actually having to have um visual confirmation um, of that going on and uh, we're showing some work we have done with Contemplate Wild at the moment so far there we go there's some snared dogs and a lot of that information is enabling um, guys to get to the snared animals a lot quicker and they are going to be adding leopards to the, the project now so um, there has been a huge amount of leopards, hyenas, wild dogs um, in particular no, that's you and me Brent it is you and me Tristy <laughs> oh look at that I mean that's that's I uh, remember Why? that was during a live stream. I mean, that is a nice snare wound. Yeah. That one we weren't too worried about. And there we go. That's dogs and Kruger. So a lot of those grant. Oh, granty. Dang. So as I said, a lot of the work contemplated being wild has been focused on, on wild dogs um, and pangolins, actually. Yes. Which is one of the reasons we can't talk about too much of it. It's, um, yeah. The great What's interesting also with those collars is that they have that X, Y, and Z axis. Mm -hmm. So it dictates movements. That way it can pick up movement in three axes. So from that data, from visually watching and then correlating what the collar is picking up, they can actually work out whether an animal is walking, running, or hunting. Riding, riding in the back of a car. Riding in the back of a car, whatever. So, it, you know, there's the tag there. Um, but those are super, super interesting data sets. Um, and it was fascinating with the pangolins. They were saying that they, they sleep so soundly that it doesn't actually move. So yeah. they've had to readjust the... the <laughs> sensitivity in order to be able to pick up what's going on but i think it's going to be super interesting with flip but another thing that talking to the guys from contemplate that they were saying is that they also want to try and branch out into multi-predator no idea as we've been saying what the numbers are mm. yeah. so they're trying to figure out how many animals do they actually have across this broader ecosystem so here is really good because he's got a lot of work in, in pumalanga but and in outside of traditional yeah areas. but Limpopo is not where he's operating very much so that's no. where we are in Hoodsprayt and, and north of us so yeah they're going to be doing some work with that too which mm. will be and, and we've supported them before yes. in terms of masks uh, and with the wild dogs and, 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 yeah. yeah but what's interesting and that's the same for all of these books that that's obviously that um, technology is supporting their work across <laughs> all the species so even though this year's donation is from remembering leopards it's it actually going to help their work exactly. across yeah, everything and, and, and the amazing thing about that whole network is that also it, it, it helps uh, the, the people on the ground mm. so you can actually have a tag and also it's they're solar, solar charged well yes there's a, they've so got a the, they what's that, like 12 year lifespan or something yeah. stupid like mm. that yeah. so yeah. i mean normally a collar lasts for 18 months and you've got to change it these yeah, collars i mean there's one collar on a dog and it's been going six years yeah 
Um, but you can also have a little tag now mm. um, on anti-poachers, on vehicles. It, 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 it really helps sort of manage the whole sort of system, yeah. which is very, very exciting. Oh, I think we went off a little bit too long there. Sorry. But now it is your <laughs> turn uh, to ask questions. So I'll start off with a question for Tristan. Uh, Basil, I want you to tight mm. on Tristan. <laughs> This is a face of a man that doesn't want this question because there's so, no doubt it's going to be... You, I think you probably know what it is already, even. So, what we really want to know... Yes, Brent. ...is, Tristan, what animal were you following when you fell out of the car? <laughs> we know the answer to this. Just, that's why I don't like your animal. <laughs> they chase leopards and they make you fall out of a car. None of us want that. So, uh, it was a wild dog. It was a wild dog. That's what I got. I got that was actually, everyone thinks because I was making fun of Taylor, it was because I left a leopard to go find the dogs. That's why I got punished. And it's because you couldn't keep up with them. But anyway, moving on. I'm sure we've got some. Um, <sighs> so, if anyone's got some questions for Margaret, now is your time. Have I got the right link? Uh, let me have a look. Yep, it is. Okay. Um, Listen, you fell out of a tree too, so don't you? Yes. Start. <laughs> I do. We both are I prone to it. falling out yeah. of things. Highly entertaining. So Michael, so if you have asked questions earlier on in the chat, please just repost them so I don't have to go back all the way to the beginning um, of the the chat. Barbara would like to know, how do you... Oh, no, that's, uh, that's a different question. Um, with high-profile leopards that have been lost in the last few years due to respective circumstances, this book will hopefully heighten awareness about the human issues that we need to address too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it is very easy for us to sort of jump to, oh no, we must just remove the people and whatnot. And that's no, not going to happen. Not gonna it's, happen. It's, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not an option. Um, these people need to live and need to have lives as well. Um, yeah. Okay, we're waiting for some more questions to come through here. Um, ah, die. This is an excellent question. Do you ever see species gradually moving into new locations, environments, and adapting to new conditions? Well, leopards are the masters. Yes. They are. And if you look at India, in Jawai. Jawai. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so there's a part of India. I don't know if you want to field this, Margot, but no, I can. No, you go ahead. I can. Um, so there's a part of India where there's uh, an area where a certain family has started to buy up farmland, um, which has created contiguous um, pieces of land that join rocky outcrops. And through that, they're starting to see species coming back into those areas and, and the leopards thriving through it. So um, I think there's ways and means to rehabilitate land if you want to call it that and wildlife to follow i think that's the the crazy thing about wildlife is it's so resilient that if it's given a chance it will just f sort of flourish and thrive um chernobyl is another place i don't know have you guys seen photos from chernobyl oh. crazy yeah. how many animals are cruising around chernobyl um in just this derelict city you know so um i think there's definitely scope for that and opportunity for that if we can get it right but the problem is is a growing number of people makes it very difficult yeah. to find land and a lot of the projects we support are just always trying to find ways to mitigate people living alongside animals whether it's mm. polar bears in alaska or um bears in italy um yeah. i mean i've got bears on my mind a lot because we're still giving out donations from last year's book um but yes, it, it's the same old story, humans conflicting with animals. And if we want them to survive, we've got to find ways that we can tolerate them. Yeah. So Suzanne's got a question for you, Margot. I would love to know what keeps you going, Margot. Um, honestly, the moment that I give out funds to a project that is maybe struggling to find funding is, is the thrill for me. It, it, it's my joy. Um, and I'd say I've got this um, bank account that takes like a long time hanging on the phone to give out the money. But every time I do and I put the phone down, I feel great. So like, for example, being able to give this donation to the Snow Leopard Project in Afghanistan already, um, knowing that that whole project would have been pulled if we hadn't done emergency funding. And we wouldn't have been able to do that if everyone hadn't bought the book on Kickstarter and all the support we've had. Um, that's, yeah, that, that's my thrill. Um, so that's why. Um, Marcy, um, aka hmm. Leopard Lady. <laughs> Hi, Marcy. Um, <laughs> Margot, not a question, just a thank you for all you do, bringing awareness to the world's most beautiful treasures. That's my pleasure. Um, Jennifer's got a, a good one here. Um, recognizing that you give all a chance, are there any prolific photographers that have had their photos published across every or almost every book in the Remembering series? 
Uh, yes, there are. But I can't remember the exact number we're at. It's nine or ten now oh, who've wow. been in every single book. So we've worked with more than 250. But what's interesting is some of them specialise more, say, in Africa. So yeah. they fell away because they didn't have any pictures of bears, bears and, yeah. and things. So, um, so yes, there's only nine or ten now who are the kind of roll call. And, and often they're the biggest names, I have to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Marcia, like that. how many submissions did you get for Leopards? A lot. <laughs> yes. A lot. Well, we not only had the, the pros who submitted, but then all the competition yeah. as well. So um, definitely more than 10,000 images that went through to select the 90 odd that's in this book. Now, this is quite an interesting one, like, particularly for me. I find it a little bit funny. This is for definitely Margaret. Margaret, what do you look for for the photographs <laughs> that you choose? <laughs> Um, I look for beautiful. No this blood is and guts. No blood and guts, Brent. <laughs> Enough with that. I look for beautiful. I look for something you would want to put on your wall as a print. Uh, because honestly, again, we raise funds from selling prints, mm. so not many people want pictures of blood and guts on their wall. Um, and um, and just something that um, is a bit unique and different for me as well. Just um, you know, th honestly, there were a lot of pictures of leopards lolling in trees this year, yeah. which is wonderful and the most exciting thing to photograph. But when you've seen it fifty times, I mean, you, you saw lots of those too, Tristan, didn't mm -hmm. you? In judging the competition, yes, ample, <laughs> ample, yes, leopard in tree photos, <laughs> leopard in tree. Yes, I've got a few of those. I think we all do. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Mauricia would like to know have you ever considered doing a book with multiple animal species in one book possibly by country or continent um, I have and lots of people have um, suggested even areas so in fact there's a photographer who's a friend of yours Rob Ross who, yeah. who did a book on the saloon and was suggesting in Tanzania that we might do that and it's an interesting idea but equally I kind of feel like I've got a format at the moment that's working so um, it's it's better, I think, not to mix things up yeah. by changing. Maybe the a best of when it's time mm. to finish. Yeah, up. Yeah, no, a, a best of at that. some point would um, would be. Although, how do I then choose? Well, yeah. you're going to offend all of us. Exactly, yeah. everyone's going to be somewhere. hurt. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it will just be ninety percent leopard, and then ten percent <coughs> everything else. Yeah, exactly. Like Hundred yeah. percent there. Yeah. So, Michael Fleetwood, was there a heavy skew towards certain areas, such as Sabi Sands or East Africa, in the submissions you received for the book? Um, y yes, most because it's where people are getting yeah. their images. Oh, uh, Sabi Sands must have been when we went through the, the most by a long way. No, yeah. so funny enough, I think Sabi Sands was close, but I think Mara was more. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, you think if photographically, the number of photographers that are travelling to the Mara is is yeah. huge uh, because there's so many other animals they can photograph there. And do you think, okay, so this is a controversial question for both of you. Is it, I suspect, because my heart is in the Mara, where mm. I um, did all my photography, is it easier to get beautiful leopard shots there because you've got the wide open landscapes as opposed to in the sands where it's a lot So I think it you. depends what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I think if you want the book cover and you want portraits, Sabi Sand, Sabi sand hands day. down, every day of the week. Or certain parts of Botswana. Bots too, yeah. Um, even South Luangwa to a degree. Mm -hmm. But if you want... Beautiful animal in landscape, beautiful lights, um, very clean backgrounds, clean foregrounds. I would say dramatic skies. Dramatic yeah. skies, Mara, and again, South Luangwa's probably got a yeah. bit of both. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I definitely think the Sabi Sands is, is a portrait place. So, like, you, you're getting the, the, the terrain and the way that the bush is, it just doesn't allow for much more. And how it's the council. Yeah, and, look, mm. and generally, most guides in the Sabi Sands want to park you on top of it. I cats. haven't actually done the sum as to what percentage of Sabi Sands, of African leopards, the Sabi yeah. Sands versus the Mara. So, when I was going through just the submissions for the judging, it was like, of the African leopards, it was almost 80% was between those two. Yeah. Well, so, the Mara was the Serengeti Mara ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It was crazy. I recognize a lot of cats through that. Um, Lisa says, Margo, your work is so inspiring. Uh, besides supporting, remembering and making donations, what else can a regular person do to help? Um, I think it, it's spreading the word. As yeah. I said, it's, it's as I learned yeah. that actually wildlife is, is not cruising along happily and um, can just be ignored, that we need to do everything we can to raise awareness of the fact that every species is under threat. Um, and also use whatever skills you've got. So I've got people who support me who are jewellers who make pieces of jewellery based yeah. on pictures for us or um, my finance director, you know, he's just using his accountancy skills. You know, if you've got a skill, offer it 
to someone who's working in conservation that you want to support? Lions, right. Lions. Well, I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, like in terms of sneering and stuff, you were talking yeah. about sneering earlier. So like one of the biggest things in South Africa is going to be somehow to change legislature. So, which is a big ask yeah. for somebody to do. Somebody's going to have to dedicate their life from a law perspective to try and tackle sneering. So it's not necessarily just boots on the ground. So I think that's exactly what you mean is mm. like do what, what your skill set is and you can make a difference more than you think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Africa Sky, question from Margot and Tristan. I think we did cover it a little bit earlier, but we'll do it again. Um, how many of uh, the subspecies have you seen? Three. Three. Well, yeah. Two plus snow leopard. Yeah, two plus snow leopard. Yes. Yeah. So try yes. seeing its Sri Lankan leopard in February. And, and then um, <laughs> Wendy wants to know, how many images can you fit in one book? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Well, I pushed it with this book. So our, all the first six books were 144 pages. Bears, I went to you can see um, the difference 160 and, and Lepers is 180. So oh, more wow. because I've got 180 um, pages. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was that was really pushing it. So you there, can because, maybe see how thick yeah. this is Leopards on the left and dogs on the right. <laughs> the, the, is, is that a bias, do you think, that, you know, just leopards, there are more beautiful pictures of leopards than African wild dogs? Well, they're much easier to take pictures yeah. of as well. Dogs uh, are on the move for most of the time. So, yeah. funny enough, dogs are actually extremely hard. difficult to photograph. Yeah. Really Massive hard. ears, slender yeah. body, body, quick running around, hard jumping. animal to photograph. Yeah. Although I'm teasing you, because yes, obviously I, I do think we have beautiful pictures yeah. in, the, in the wild dog book. So, Ulla says, Margot, did you see snow or clouded... No, it will be only snow leopards in Bhutan. Clouded leopards mm. are forests and... Um, so they... Uh, you, yeah. The only country that I know of that you can see snow and clouded is um, India. Yeah. But uh, were you, were, you guys were in India, not Bhutan, though. Right? No, we were in India. Yes. Yeah. yeah so I have been to Bhutan, but I didn't see yeah. any. Bhutan's very small, and I don't think they have a snow leopard industry that's going... So this is the other thing with snow leopards, is that a lot of the countries that have them, there's not actually a tourism mm. industry. Mongolia around. is going to be an mm. interesting one for the future. For Mongolia snow. will be the next big one. Yeah. It really is. There's yeah. lots of people traveling to Mongolia, and, and the reason for that is that, unlike a lot of the other countries, there's not an altitude problem. Uh -huh. So you're at much lower altitude for them. Yeah. It's almost half. The um, which of the animals in the series is currently experiencing the best and worst turnaround in terms of population rebound and decrease? That's from Jennifer. That's a hard one. I, well, like I would the, say probably Ellie. Yeah, exactly. But Ellie's are, I suppose Ellie's is tough because it depends where. Where, and it depends on, you know. Rhinos are pretty sta well, stable. Well, not stable. They're not really doing stable. much no. now. Yeah. Um, dogs are actually, well, in South Africa, um, dogs are increasing. But that's again, like I said, it's, it's geographic. Locally, where there is there and massive Same pressure in, in Sudan and Cameroon and places like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the, the pressure on elephants that started the whole series and the rate of poaching has dropped away since China banned ivory, um, yeah. honestly. But there's still huge problems with elephants and mainly around conflict now. Yeah. Um, Ulla says we're wrong and Bhutan has both. I'm not really? sure. Really? I'll double check on that. She said, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I would and love to know where that population of clouded is in Bhutan. But I suppose if it's India's got, then it must be on that border. Border, yeah. yeah. Mm. So there is a, there's a, a question from Janine now. Um, are you going to be reprinting books? Because quite a lot of people who are looking for rhinos <laughs> 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 to, to, to end up the collection. Do you know, two days ago, our South African distributor still had copies on, listed on their website, which I uh, sent someone to. So have a look on HBH to see if they're there. But... Yeah. Um, it's it's really tough because it's like a minimum of like twenty five thousand dollar investment to yeah, reprint and to sell that many books. Yes, and lot. then I could end up with stock, and that twenty five thousand dollars I could give to a project. So yeah. at the moment, no is the answer. I think that's the thing is that a lot of people don't realise is that these books are not not it's cheap, not it's not right. a cheap exercise to do a whole print run of them and distribute them. Well, and it's not worthwhile. Yeah. None of the printers are going to do fifty or ten or twenty. No, books no, and do. the more you, the fewer you do, the higher the, the unit cost. Yeah. So then yeah. it can cost more than I can actually sell them for if I do a lower yeah. number. So yeah. it, it, it doesn't make economic sense. So if anyone would like to sponsor reprinting rhinos, then talk to me. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to start wrapping up, up now. Um, Jennifer, we're like the oldest known leopard, who, where, and how old? So the oldest one I ever knew about was Tavangumi, not yeah. the male. The female. The, the female Sunita. Sunita. She was 20, yeah. just over 20. Yeah. yeah. And then Safari, so yeah, she was Krula's mom, was 19 and a half. Yeah. 
That's the, I think that's the two oldest. I mean, those are, and we're talking wild leopards. Captivity, yeah, I think 21, see. just over 21 is the uh, oldest. Yeah, trail. I think um, half tail in the Mara, I think she got to 18. Yeah, I mean, it's still old. It's ancient, yeah. Mm. yeah. Safari was crazy. She had one eye and she still survived yeah, till 19 and a half. Eye. For like seven years, she had that wow. blind eye. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, that photo in the book of the leopard going under the fence in the wildlife estate, she's blind in one Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. I'm surprised actually we didn't get any photos in the book of leopards with uh, oh, different color eyes. Different colored eyes, mm. yeah. Because there's she quite a few out there. I haven't seen one in that while though. There's one in Kruger that's been getting seen recently. If anyone goes to around Skakuz area, S65, uh, mm. on there. There was one in Mala Mala for a few years, many yeah. years ago. But um, I just want to say a big thank you to Margot and Tristan for joining us this evening. Pleasure, um, what a special way to end off uh, That's Wild for the year. And uh, we do have another last treat at the end of the credits. So obviously, I know a lot of you have got to love the bloopers that will come during the credits. But wait till after the credits. There is a treat coming. And I'm sure you're all going to enjoy it. But a big thank you to all of you for supporting That's Wild this year. And uh, it will be starting again next year. Just keep an eye on our socials for what date. It's been great. It's been grand. And we'll see you in the new year. Thanks. We're about to go do a voiceover with Yana in our filming studio, our voice recording studio. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> nice, goodbye. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> Crashed in to 
is hollow I'm finally done Oh, oh, oh.